Today's Gospel reading comes from Colossians, the third chapter, verses 5 to 8, and also 12 to 17. In this letter to the Colossians, Paul is telling us how to have new life in Christ. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, there's always this startling contrast between Mother's Day and Father's Day. That's always going to kick out. It always makes me laugh. Mother's Day, we always prepare the church for a pretty full church. We're going to have a lot of people here that bring their mothers or their grandmothers or their great-grandmothers' families do when they come to church and worship. And then maybe they go to a restaurant and they go home and have a big meal. Father's Day, the fathers tend to take a break from church. So here's what I've decided to do next year. We're going to hang some hammocks in here. Get a few big screen TVs, set them up, a keg of beer, and we'll fill the church up. I got an amen out there. Got an amen. So look out next year. Oh, hey, we do that every week. We fill the church up. I was thinking about walls this past week. There's been lots of conversation in our culture about walls. And it got me to thinking years and years ago when I was in seminary. And we would think about walls go up and walls go down, right? It's a natural thing. It's called building, construction, destruction, whatever you want to call it. But I remember when we were in seminary and we had a professor and actual a minister who was teaching us about what it was going to be like when we went to our churches. And I remember the question was asked of him, what will we be able, as far as changes in a church, what will we be able to get away with our first year? That was a genuine question. And this is what he said, pretty much exactly. He said, well, he said, it's pretty easy to move stuff around. He said, it's pretty easy to hang stuff up. It's pretty easy to turn stuff on or turn stuff off. But if you move or tear down or build a wall, you're going to need to get a vote from the congregation because members fight over walls. Now, I kind of took that with a grain of salt until I had my first major conflict in a congregation and it was sure enough during a capital campaign about building and tearing down walls. And I never forgot, I never forgot what that professor said. The teacher said he was absolutely right. Walls can evoke strong feelings in our hearts. We remember Reagan saying, standing at the Berlin Wall and going, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, because we the whole world 
saw the tearing down of that wall as a symbol, a symbol for freedom. And it was a very powerful symbol for freedom. Then another powerful symbol came along not too much later when a wall was built between Israel and Palestine. And at least as far as the Israel government was concerned, that was a symbol for them of security. Although many people are still critical about that wall as a divisive symbol between Israel and Palestine, still it is there. And it shows that Israel decided to choose and chose security over the openness of an open society between the two cultures. And now we're fighting about walls in our nation. And it's the same topic. Freedom versus security. We think of America, don't we? Many of us do. As a bastion of freedom. We think of the Statue of Liberty. Give us your poor, your tired, your hungry, your oppressed, yearning to be free. Powerful words. America as a bastion of freedom. But we also think of America as a place, as a bastion of prosperity. As a bastion of where we can feed our children and raise them. As a bastion of promise, right? And sometimes these two views can conflict with each other. And they don't just do that in nations or in culture. They do it in the church as well. And that started from the very, very beginning of the Christian church. Because we have to remember that the church of Jesus Christ started not as an institutionalized church, but as a spiritual movement. And movements are scary things. Movements are powerful, and movements are scary, and movements are risky. They carry their own risk with them. The basic conflict in Paul's day that was affecting the church was not so much a religious one or a spiritual one, it was a cultural one. And it was a conflict between two worldviews. One worldview was the Gentile worldview, the pagan worldview. The other worldview was the Jewish worldview. And they were both very, very different. Now, the, the, the Christianity as a movement was, was, was embedded in that worldview of the Gentiles, that pagan culture that has, was now coming into the church. They saw the freedom of the church as something they'd never seen before. They loved it. They were amazed by it. And they not only embraced it, they promoted it strongly, even to the point of confusion. They loved the fact that Christianity broke many, many of the cultural barriers of its time. But over against that worldview that celebrated the freedom of the Christian church was the view of Christianity as a wall of legalism. The view that Christianity was a Jewish sect. A Jewish sect saying that it was a part of the Jewish religion. And that, would, that language would make sense because Jesus was a Jew. And the Messiah was, as originally declared, a Jewish Messiah. So many righteous Jews who were like Paul, who had been strict followers of the law, came into the church. And you can imagine their discomfort when these two worldviews collided. And they did in Paul's churches throughout Asia Minor. As we read Paul's letters, there are practical examples of this. We see in Corinthians a great deal. Paul is writing to Corinthians in response to their situation. And we see a great deal of confusion in the church at Corinth. Great deal of confusion. 
People are arguing about what it means to follow Christ. And there are all kinds of different arguments going on. The biggest argument is the argument, well, you know, it's a spiritual movement. We are now spiritual beings, so our bodies really don't matter. The earth really doesn't matter. Laws really don't matter. So we basically can do what we need to do. If our husbands are paying, we'll just divorce them. That, and the reason I say husbands is because that was a big issue in Corinthians. Corinthian Christian wives were asking, should we just divorce our husbands? They're not Christians. Right? And, and why do we need to remain in that kind of marriage? There was also confusion about, you know, about among men, about, well, why can't we go to the temple celebrations, which of course were social and work related? Why can't we go to the temple celebrations and participate, participate in cult prostitution? Because we're spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. Why does it matter what we do with our bodies? There was a great deal of confusion that Paul had to address in the Corinthian church. On the other side was the Galatian church filled with Jewish Christians. And they were going to the opposite extreme. They were demanding that any Gentiles that joined the church obey the festivals, follow the festivals of the Jewish calendar, be circumcised, which was not a popular message, as you can imagine, and obey the dietary laws. And they were demanding this. And Paul, if you read Galatians, it is an angry letter. He is very angry about this. And he even to the point of him saying, I wish you people who are demanding this would circumcise yourselves. Yeah, that, that, that's rough language right there. And he meant it in the crudest way imaginable. He did he was, he was very upset about that. And we have modern parallels to those two extremes today. It's been going on now for 2,000 years. Hadn't changed. Think about some of the modern, I guess you might call them, mega churches or evangelical churches that you see on television. Take, for example, Joel Osteen's church, which, if you see that and listen to it carefully, is really more about positive thinking, right? If you listen to it, it is. Osteen admits that. He's not hiding anything. It's more about positive thinking than necessarily preaching the gospel. Same was true for Bill Hyde's Willow Creek. Willow Creek even removed the cross from its church so as not to offend people who were, they would call seekers. He moved across. I don't know if they put it back on it. They did. So we see that kind of kind of uh, looseness, I guess, loose understanding of theology. On the other hand, there's the fundamentalist Christians who judge everything and who abide by these locked-in, strict understandings of what it means to be a Christian, and especially what it means not to be a Christian. I want us to think about the word fashion. In Colossians, Paul notes that Christ gave the church as a spiritual bastion for the world. Now, what does that word mean? I used it a while ago, bastion. Defined as a fortified area or position a stronghold. Now, is it not true that if that's the definition of a bastion, then if Christianity is a bastion, it can be a bastion for, or it can be a bastion against. It can be a stronghold for something, or it can be a stronghold against something. And of course, the great division in the early church was that risk of not finding a spiritual balance. A balance between ultimate anarchy in the life of the church or smothering oppression. Either one. Now, what would I mean by anarchy in the life of the church? Well, it would be as Paul confronted.
confronted at the surrendering of our distinctive Christian values. What makes us uniquely Christian? The cross makes us uniquely Christian. That's a symbol. And there are other things as well. There is, there are ethical and moral and spiritual distinctions. Our values that set us apart from other religions and set us apart from the rest of the world. Being a Christian means something distinctive. And to compromise those can lose the clear definition of what it means to be the church. I mean, are we a church or are we a club? Are we a church or are we a nonprofit organization? I like to think about it this way. Churches are social organizations, right? Sure. Churches can be very clubby and members, right? Sure. Churches are nonprofits, right? But nonprofits are not churches. Clubs are not churches. And social organizations are not churches. In other words, it is saying something distinctive to be a church. On the other side, we talk about anarchy, there's oppression. That extreme self-righteousness and judgment. I was a pastor, uh, my wife and I, in a room, in the town of a small town, Lotus, North Carolina. And a wonderful church, wonderful church, Locust Presbyterian. Good friends still there. And it was really the heart of mission in that community. And one time a person, a young woman, came to me and she said, she asked, she requested, could you baptize my child? And, then, and I said, well, tell me the story here. Well, you know, as you would normally do, tell me a little bit of the story. Why you want me to baptize your child? She was the daughter of a prominent family in that community in a prominent fundamentalist church. She had her baby out of the way. And she told me that the pastor and the leadership of that church refused to acknowledge her. They refused to recognize her child. They asked her to leave because her presence embarrassed the congregation. She had had a child out of wedlock. And I said to her, well, I need to take it to the session, but from my point of view, of course we'll baptize your child. We'll do that, of course. We'll recognize this gift from God that you've received. And we did. We did. That's the kind of abuse, spiritual abuse, that unfortunately we as pastors all too often hear in our work. Paul knows that Christ gave the church, as I said, as a spiritual bastion to the world, but he reveals the foundation of the balance of what it means to be a bastion. That delicate balance between anarchy or oppression in his letter to the Colossians. And his letter was unique to the situation of the Colossians at that time. What was going on in the church of Colossia, which was a church in Asia, Colossae, which was a church in Asia Minor, was not anarchy, but it was Jewish syncretism. Now, what do I mean by Jewish syncretism? It was, syncretism means blended. And the issue was not paganism or pagan practices. The issue was a Jewish, mystical, religious point of view, which was very ascetic. It was the kind that you worked to have a vision and you had an angel. There was this hierarchy of ten archangels and ten ranks of angels. And you would have them be your spirit guide so that you could have this vision of God sitting upon 
God's throne, and they had in this church included this vision of Christ sitting with God side of the throne. And this mysticism was becoming very influential in the church of Colossae to the point that many of the members were literally retasking their Christianity toward this mystical experience. And you started to get the language. I've heard it before. If you don't have this mystical experience, there's something wrong with your faith. You've heard that. That's cultism. You hear it all the time. It's what a cult is. So this mystical cult was, was inflicting itself upon the church of Colossae. They had torn down the wall of Christ's uniqueness, but at the same time they built a wall of legalism and perfectionism. You have to fast so many days. You have to do these terribly difficult things to your health in order to get to the point of having this vision. Paul had to give that church a solution, a way out, and he did. He told them, as we just heard, as Jan read, he told them that the love of Christ indeed does liberate. It is. It liberates. But it liberates us for the responsibility not of having mystical visions, but of being disciples. He gave it a practical answer. And he said, you don't have to see God sitting in the heaven or Christ. We've already seen Christ and he wasn't sitting on the heaven. He was on the cross. And we really saw him. And that's all of Christ. And all of God you need to see. And therefore, Christ dwells within you. He's there. You don't have to look for him. You don't have to have a vision of him. You don't have to have an angel helper to get you there. He's inside of you. He lives in you. And your task is to let him live out of you. Out of your life. We read this in Colossians 3, this passage. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly. And then he goes through this list including idolatry. And he says, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth because movements like this mystical cult movement could wind up being very divisive and causing a lot of these things to happen. He also, interestingly enough, follows those words with language in the Greek that basically says, take off your old clothes. That's the image. Your clothes that don't fit. You've done that, he said. You've done that by becoming a Christian. You took off those old pagan or, or mystical or cultic clothes. And then he goes into the next part. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves. You still got to be clothed. You can't run around without clothes. Get arrested. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. This is, this is pretty loose. Very tolerant, isn't it? It is. But then he says this. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. And what does love do? Does it free us to run around and do what we want? No. He says love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Which binds everything together. It is a reconciliation of offices. We think about binding love. Do you know that spiritual love, true love, is always binding? Today's Father's Day. We talk about family love. Are we not bound to each other? Are parents not bound to children? Children bound to parents and love? If that doesn't happen, you've got what they call a dysfunctional family. Is that not true? Marital love. Very binding. I mean, those vows. Woo! Till death do you part, sister or brother. That's as strong a vow as you can make in this culture today. That's binding. 
It's obligation. And yet, why do we do that? Why do we bind ourselves? Because it's also liberating. It's free to love someone wholly in that way. Agape. That's the word for love in Christianity. Agape is a binding spiritual relationship. And out of that spiritual relationship, we are bound to a set of values. A set of values. Not, we don't put on a suit of armor. That's not what he says. We put on the appropriate thing that Christians are supposed to put on. The binding love of Christ. On Father's Day, we think about the family. We think about the clearly defined role of a parent. But within that definition, love demands flexibility, adaptation, patience, tolerance, understanding, and finding that right balance between freedom and discipline. No, you can't cross the street on your own. Because I love them. Because I love them. That's where we learn. That's why when we speak, when Paul speaks of the Church of Jesus Christ, he calls it a bastion, but it is a bastion of love. A bastion of love. We build ethical boundaries sometimes between ourselves and the world so that the Christian name can keep its distinctiveness. So we can distinguish ourselves on what Christ taught us. We know what those are. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Forgive not one time, but 70 times, 70 times seven. Love your enemy as yourself. Those are distinctive. Those are unique. But at the same time that we bind ourselves to that Christian ethic, we also break down barriers between us and the world. God sent us out into the world to break those barriers, those ethnic barriers. We break them down in the face of a world that's trying to build them, trying to create them. The generational barriers. We find a way to live together in the different generations, to worship together to live out our lives in Christ. Economic and political barriers. The church was one of the first places where people who were totally separated from each other in their culture actually worshiped together. And it is a fight. There is resistance to that. But it is imperative for us to do so. To break those economic and political barriers down. So, we leave ourselves with a question. Are we bastions, each of us, and together, are we bastions of Christian faith? Walls go down and walls go up. We know that. But no matter how many walls we tear down, we're going to tear down a few walls here next year. Back there, as you know. But it doesn't matter. Faith remains the bastion of the church. Love remains the bastion church, enabling us to be strong in our ethic and gentle in our tolerance and in our love. That's what it means to be a Christian in the Reformed Church. And that is who we are. Amen.